everyone. My name is Leah, and this is my husband, Garrett. Um, we are just thankful to be a part of this service together. And um, I just want to pray before we worship together. Father God, um, I just thank you so much just for the fact that we're still able to connect with one another. And um, I just pray over our time, Lord, that God, that it just be a restful time, that it be a joyful time, that um, you just get all the praise and honor. Um, we thank you for everything in your name. Amen. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break. Has broken hearts to play His praise For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah He's roaring with power and fighting our battles Every knee will bow before Him Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world, His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before Him. So open up the gates, make way before the King. Of kings, our God who comes to say is He to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Heaven bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before him. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 Who can stop the Lord? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that we slay. For the sins of the world, His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before Him. Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, is my song. Let the King of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, is my song. You are good, good, oh, you are good. Oh, 
Let the King of my heart be the wind inside my sails. The anchor in the waves, oh, is my song. Let the King of my heart be the fire inside my veins. The echo of my days, oh, is my song. Let the King of my heart be the wind. Hello, Encounter family. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are so happy to have you here. If you are having any trouble with our live stream, you can take a look in the chat below and one of our hosts will have posted the link or you can head to our website and find the video on our homepage as well. And if at any time during the service today, you feel like you are in need of some prayer, you can click the live prayer button to the right of the screen at any time during the service and one of our Encounter hosts will be available and ready to pray with you at any time. Now, as always, we are so grateful for your continued giving during this time. If you feel led to give today, you can head to our website and find ways to give there. And as always, be sure to be following us on all of our social media. We have Facebook and Instagram, and there you will find any upcoming events or recent news going on on campus. And we also love seeing what you're up to, so if you post anything, be sure to tag us so we can like it and share it. And this one is for our Encounter Kids families. We have our block party coming up on August 29th. So if you haven't already, go ahead to our website and reserve a time where you can come drive through and see our Encounter leaders. We are so excited to see you and it's going to be so much fun. Thank you so much again for joining us today. Hello, Encounter family. Thank you for joining me today. I know some of you are having a tough week because you planned on your kids going back to school this week and it's not happening quite the way you thought. It's hard being at home, on Zoom, uh, trying to do school from home. Some of you are trying to work from home and you've got kids under your feet and it's just really, really difficult. Somebody I was talking to just recently said, this is the year of losses for me. I thought, wow, that's a great description. I think a lot of us can resonate with that. 
We probably all have our own list of losses. But it also takes us right to this passage we're in today, and it kind of knits our heart with Paul as he's expressing his hope in the future despite current difficulties. Think about Paul. He had lost a lot as well. He had traveled all over the known world and established all these churches, and now he's there under house arrest in Rome facing potential execution. So in a very real sense, we, I don't know, there's something about this environment. We can understand what Paul is saying, even maybe in ways that we haven't quite understood it before. Paul is looking out toward the future, and he says, regardless of what's going on right now, I am hopeful because my citizenship, my true home, lies ahead. It's with God forever. And that gives us a different perspective on the hard things we face here and now. Today, in this section of, Paul, in section of Scripture, Paul is going to talk about what's ahead. I've talked to a lot of people about what they think about will happen when they die, especially when I'm at a memorial service or something like that, or maybe in the hospital visiting somebody who's confronting their own mortality. People really wonder, what's going to happen to me when I die? Some people think we just cease to exist. Some people say, oh, we all go to a better place. Some people say we become angels. Some people think we go to purgatory to work off our sins. I talked to one guy who said, well, me and my friends, we're just going to party in hell. It's going to be great. Uh, maybe not. I read a story about this one couple who went to a yard sale and they bought what they thought was a box of Halloween decorations. They got it home and they looked in the box and it was these bones, but there was something weird about it. They seemed a little too real. So they called the sheriff. The sheriff came and picked up the box took it to the medical examiner in their town who confirmed that the, this couple had actually bought at a yard sale for $8 parts of a actual human anatomical skeleton, pro professionally prepared for like a medical course. That's kind of creepy. I don't know if the people got to keep their box of bones or not, but some people just think that, that when we die, we end up as a box of bones. We all end up as Halloween decorations. But what does Scripture have to say about what happens when we die? Well, that's what I want to look at with you today. Let me begin by talking about some of the misperceptions people have, misconceptions of what happens when we die. Uh, one of them is universalism, which believes that nearly everybody makes it into heaven. I mean, maybe some of the really bad people like axe murderers or Hitler or whatever don't quite make it in, but the rest of us probably will. Why would God send decent people like us to hell? That's sort of the idea behind universalism. The problem is that Jesus often spoke about hell as a reality, and he was often speaking to very decent people, at least the religious leaders and teachers of the law of that day. He said things like this in Matthew chapter 7, "'Enter through the narrow gate.'" For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Now think about it for a minute. If universalism were true, and we all eventually just get to heaven, the New Testament doesn't really make any sense. Why would we be encouraged to take the gospel to the whole world if people are going to go to heaven anyway? Well, why all the stress about becoming saved? I mean, why does this become the central theme of the Holy Scriptures? We would turn to God and be saved from destruction. Why would it say that if there was no real destruction? And why do we need to be saved at all if, I mean, why... Do we need to make a decision here in this world about Christ if we all end up going to heaven anyway? So I think we need to take into account what Jesus actually said when he was here. In John chapter 8, listen to these words very carefully. He said, I told you that you would die in your sins if you do not believe that I am he, in other words, the Savior. I told you, you would die in your sins. If you do not believe that I am he, you will indeed die in your sins. 
Now he repeats that twice, and he was speaking to the religious leaders when he said that. So I think that pretty well rules out universalism. Um, there's another misconception, and that is annihilationism. This has to do with those who reject God's grace. This theory says that hell may exist, but it's not gonna be forever. In other words, after a while, we sort of pay off our sins, and then we cease to exist if we have gone to hell. Well, listen to the words of Daniel chapter 12. In there, it says this, multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Jesus taught the same thing when he said that, uh, we talked about those who would go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Grammatically, there's no difference in the scriptures between eternal life and the eternal separation from God. So I don't think we can safely say that we just cease to exist at some point. Honestly, I realize that the concept of eternity or eternal life or eternal separation from God is very one difficult one to get our heads around. It's just hard to think about eternity when we're so finite. But I think that's where we have to just simply go, you know what, God knows these things. God is 100% loving, God is 100% just, and he knows things we don't know. He sees things from a different vantage point. So we simply have to trust what he says is true. There's a third common misconception, and that is that um, hell is not literal. There may be a hell, but it won't be that bad. Maybe it's just all sort of symbolic. I mean, think about all the words that are used in scripture for this place called hell, like smoke, and fire, and burning, torment, eternal death, second death, uh, blackness, darkness. People, some people have said, well, there can't be both fire and darkness at the same time. So it's symbolic. So it's not really all that bad. But think about it for a minute. I mean, why would God give us all these symbols of something horrible if it wasn't horrible? Um, I was reading pastor uh, and theologian R.C. Sproul, and he writes this. He says, if the references to fire and darkness are symbolic, they're symbolic because the reality is too awful for words. That sounds a lot like what Paul wrote in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, where he says, they will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord. It is clearly opposite of everything that is good and everything that's life and everything that God wants for people. In fact, it says in scripture that God longs that all people would come to repentance and receive salvation. That's God's heart for people. He's not just trying to send people to hell. But Jesus said hell is a reality. And that is why he came to save us. Um, consider this. There's a world of difference between being offensive and saying something that offends people. Some people I've talked to said, well, I'm offended that anybody would even bring up the idea of hell. It's interesting that Jesus brought it up more than anybody else in scripture but he didn't do it to offend people. Um, here's the truth. Many things done in love may offend people without being intended as offensive. If you take the car keys away from a drunk, he's probably gonna get offended, but it's not meant to be an offense. In the same way, what Jesus said about hell wasn't meant to be offensive. It was actually meant to save people from something that God desires us to be saved from. One thing I know for sure, and that is that God doesn't want anybody there, which is why he sent us a savior. Which brings us to the, the next misconception, and that's this, that, well, maybe we go to a place where we kind of work off our sins, and then we're good enough to go to heaven, often called purgatory. The biggest problem is there's nothing actually about purgatory in the Bible. The concept of purgatory was uh, is based in some teaching in the Apocrypha, which is a group of writings between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And in the Apocrypha, it talks about a hero named Judas Maccabeus, who uh, was trying to set the people free. This is about 165 BC, trying to set the Jews free from Roman oppression. And in those writings, Judas Maccabeus talks about making payment for the sins of some who had died. 
Well, uh, much later in 6th century AD, uh, Pope Gregory picked up on this idea and uh, kind of developed this into our modern understanding of purgatory. But the biggest problem with that is it gets back to this idea that we can pay for our sins. And that's just not what scripture says. Listen to the words, these words from Paul in Ephesians chapter two. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works. You can't pay for your sins because Jesus already has. I finally just let me throw out one more misconception. That's the idea of reincarnation kind of popular right now, the idea that people come back to this world as someone or something else, but there's nothing in the Bible even remotely like that. Hebrews chapter nine says, people are destined to die once and after that to face the judgment. Jesus told a story about, a, about Lazarus who died and a rich man who died. And the rich man had no regard for Lazarus in life. And, and uh, after they die, one is in a place of God's care, um, Lazarus, it says, is in the bosom of Abraham. In other words, he's, he's right there with Abraham, who was one of the forefathers of uh, the Jewish faith. And then this other guy who had no regard for anybody but himself, he's in a place of torment. So in the story that Jesus told, these two guys end up in two different places right after they die. It's not like we come back and get another chance. I'm sure this guy who died that had no regard for anybody but himself would have loved to come back um, but that wasn't given to him as an option. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse eight, Paul writes, we are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So according to scripture, there's no reincarnation. We live once and we die once, which brings us right to this section of scripture we're in today. Paul's gonna talk about his citizenship in heaven over against this backdrop of just living for the temporary. So if you would, go with me to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, go to verse 18. And Paul's going to start there with this background of those who have no regard for Christ at all. He says, for, I, for as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. What does he mean by that? It means that they, they're living their life in a way that has no regard at all for the salvation that God has brought us through the cross. And he goes on to describe in general terms what that looks like. He says their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach, their glory is in their shame, and their mind is set on earthly things. So he's just saying they're basically people that are living for here and now. Just, you know, that kind of that mentality of, uh, it's all about me, it's about what I can accumulate, uh, this is all there is, there's no future. He says, but in contrast to that, verse 20, our citizenship is in heaven. In other words, in other words that's our true home. Uh, more than any other sense of identity, that is our identity. It's in Christ, it's with God, it's forever. Uh, it's in this new heaven and new earth that God is gonna be uh, with us in after we die. He says, but our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Let me talk for just a few minutes here about what the Bible says about those who belong to God. The first reality is that our earthly journey is temporal. Uh, just did today, I was driving out of my neighborhood and somebody had taken an old mattress from their home and thrown it out on the curb and put a sign on it that said free. And I just thought, a free, like beat up old used mattress? Like who would really want that? But then I got thinking about this body of ours. It's kind of like that. I mean, this body just wears out. In the end, I mean, no matter how well we take care of it, in the end, it's just worn out and uh, it's gonna die, it's gonna be over. Um, in a sense, nobody wants it. We get used up. At some point, this heart stops beating. Uh, at some point, this brain shuts down. And then what? 
First Peter chapter one says people are like grass and like a flower. Grass withers and flowers just fall away. And James uses this imagery. He says you're like a mist that appears for a little while and then is gone. Just before King David died, he wrote in 1 Chronicles 29, he says, we're foreigners and strangers here. Our days on earth are like a shadow. So really, no matter what we do here in this world with these bodies, they're gonna wear out, they're gonna, there's an expiration date on every single one of us. Uh, Vance Havner wrote this about us who belong to Christ. He said, Christians are not citizens of earth trying to get to heaven but citizens of heaven making their way through this world. Or as C.S. Lewis said, you don't have a soul, you are a soul, you have a body. So the first concept we need to really get clear is, there's no point in living just for this world. It's all temporary, it's all gonna wear out. It's gonna be over soon. Um, this journey is definitely temporary. Here's a second concept I think we need to keep in mind. Our true home lies ahead of us. Notice what Paul says, he says, my citizenship. Think about what a citizenship is. You know, when I've been overseas, oftentimes I think about home, I think about America, I think about coming back, and I think about the fact that uh, my, my passport says that I'm a citizen of America. That feels like home. No matter where I go, I'm always thinking about coming back. Paul is saying that about heaven. No matter where I go in this world, ultimately, I'm looking forward to going there. That is my true home, my truest identity. A citizen of heaven. And we are waiting, we are eagerly awaiting our Savior's return from there. And then our bodies are gonna be completely replaced with a brand new eternal body. Some people just think, well, about heaven, like we're just kind of floating around like angels or disembodied spirits. But really, we're going to have a brand new, real body of some form, like a real physical body of some form, kind of like Jesus when he rose from the grave. It says in scripture that he was the first fruits, in other words, the first of all who would follow. So our bodies are going to be something like his. I love how Randy Alcorn describes uh, something about this, about these bodies when we get to heaven. Uh, it, the way he writes it here is a, a little bit disjointed, so just listen carefully as I read it to you um, and try to follow along with me. He says, here we have bodies and we work, rest, play, and relate to one another. We call this life. Yet many have mistakenly redefined eternal life to mean an off-earth, disembodied existence stripped of human life's defining properties. In fact, eternal life will mean enjoying forever as resurrected, which means embodied beings, what life on earth at its finest offered us. We could more accurately call our, pre our present existence the before life rather than calling heaven the afterlife. Life doesn't merely continue in heaven, it emerges at last to its intended fullness. I love that. Here's the third, our, our body upgrade is guaranteed. Uh, when I saw that old mattress laying out on the side of the street, I kind of thought, you know, my old body's kind of wearing down as well. There's little parts that aren't working quite right. Uh, and the truth is we don't really get better and better as we go along, but Paul's saying, Man, I'm looking forward to the fact that I'm going to get a brand new body that won't wear out, that doesn't have broken parts, that is designed for this eternal place with God. Uh, Romans 8 verse 23 says, We wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. Uh, Britain's uh, foremost scholar and theologian N.T. Wright, um, Bible scholar, he writes this, there is no room for doubt as to what God means. God's people are promised a new type of bodily existence, the fulfillment and redemption of our present bodily life. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says that it's like planting a seed in the ground and then it's raised to life. It becomes this flowering plant or tree, something beautiful, something 
magnificent compared to life as a seed. He says in the same way, when we die, our, our bodies may be planted in the ground, but we are going to become something else, something much more beautiful, something greater. I think I mentioned, you know, Jesus in his resurrected form. When we think about that, it's maybe a good visual for us. It's a way for us to picture our future because Jesus, after he raised from the dead, he, he was seen by hundreds of people. He was recognized. He was in physical form. He could uh, be seen. He could be touched. People could see the, the scars in his hands. He ate with his disciples. And yet he had this ability to move freely and quickly from one place to another. Uh, I don't understand that, but I think it's pretty cool. I think it's pretty exciting to think about all the capabilities we'll have with these bodies in our new home, in our new place with God. John wrote down this in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. He said, we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. That's a pretty powerful statement. When Christ appears, we shall be like him. In other words, we're going to get a brand new body that's kind of like his resurrected body. That's awesome. In light of all these truths, in light of how wonderful all this is, Paul says, okay, take all this in because based on this, we can be resilient even in the hardships we're facing now. So he begins the very next chapter with these words. He says, therefore, which means thinking back on everything I've just written, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way. Stand firm in the Lord in this way. In other words, taking all this into account, keeping in mind our future, stand firm. How are we going to be resilient even in COVID-19, even as it drags on month after month, even as we experience these losses and disappointments and disruptions? I think it's by having in mind that this is not all there is. This is not our true home. We are citizens of another kingdom, and our king is another king. So the fourth on your notes there is this. Our eternal future is a sure reality. This isn't something that's just mentioned once or twice in Scripture and as kind of a maybe or we hope so. This is an absolute sure reality reality. Jesus said, I am going to prepare a place for you, and I am going to come back and take you to be where I am. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul writes this, we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. And then he adds, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Many of you know the name Johnny Erickson Tata. She became a, became a quadriplegic in a diving accident when she was uh, about a senior in high school. <clears throat> she wrote a book called Heaven, Your Real Home, and she, in there she reflects on her years of being a quadriplegic. She wrote this, Nothing more radically altered the way I look at my suffering than an end-of-time vantage point. Heaven became my greatest hope. In fact, I wondered how other people could possibly face quadriplegia, cancer, or even a death in the family without the hope of heaven. The Bible speaks of our bodies being glorified in heaven. In high school, that was always a hazy foreign concept. But now I realize that I will be healed I have not been cheated out of being a complete person. I'm just going through a 40-year delay, and God is with me even through that. Being glorified, I know the meaning of that now. It's the time after my death here when I will be on my feet dancing. Let me close with these words from the message, a paraphrase of Hebrews chapter 6, verses 18 and 19. God can't break his word. And because his word cannot change, the promise is likewise unchangeable. We who have run for our very lives to God have every reason to grab the promised hope with both hands and never let go. It's an unbreakable spiritual lifeline reaching past all appearances right to the very presence of God. My prayer is that your heart will be really genuinely encouraged today. Keep that view in mind. 
this is all temporary. This body is temporary. No matter how much it hurts or gives out, it's temporary. And we have a future home. We have a future kingdom. We have a, a God that is going to be coming to get us. And I just want to encourage you today, people, no matter what we go through during this season, this isn't the end of the story. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you encourage our hearts with this future hope. And it's a real hope. It's a reality that is becoming clearer every day. And I think even in a season like this of hardships, it helps us. It actually helps us to, to grab hold of that reality uh, and maybe even picture it or visualize it or think about it more than we normally do. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would help us to stay heavenly minded so that we can be of earthly good. I believe that the more we are convinced of our future with you, the more we're able to release ourselves to just love people and serve people here and now. Thank you, Lord, for this amazing passage of Scripture where Paul reminds us of what's real and what's ahead for us. And I pray for anybody listening today who may be unsure, not really certain of their future in you. I pray that even right now in these moments, they would simply humble their heart before you, cry out to you, and confess that you are Lord and you are Savior. God, I pray that they would understand how much you long to save them and how much you long to pour out your grace on them. I pray, Lord, today that everybody listening to these words would embrace you fully, lean into your grace, acknowledge that you are Savior and Lord, and follow you with our whole hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining me today. all the poor and powerless and all the lost and lonely and all the thieves will come confess and know that you are holy and all that you are holy and all To our contents, and all feel unworthy, and all who heard with nothing left, I know that you are holy, and all will sing our hallelujah.